Hello and welcome to Media 7. In this week's programme, we're all about the kids. Youth crime, youth unemployment, teen drinking, teen driving. There's no shortage of bad news about the young folk. But is that fair or reasonable? And then later on, we'll look at the long and short of film funding. Should budding filmmakers be funded into short films or encouraged to make full digital features for the same money? But first, it's youth and the media. Simon Pound look at, looks at some recent claims that youth media use isn't just business as usual. Recently, Morgan Stanley, the financial services company, released this report into how teenagers are using media. It was written by a 15-year-old intern at the company and generated mountains of response for insights like these. Radio. Most teenagers nowadays are not regular listeners to radio. With online sites streaming music for free, they do not bother. TV. Teenagers are also watching less television because of services that allow them to watch shows when they want. Newspapers. No teenager that I know of regularly reads a newspaper, as most do not have the time and cannot be bothered to read pages and pages of text. Music. Teenagers listen to a lot of music, mostly whilst doing something else. They are very reluctant to pay for it, most never having bought a CD. Twitter. Teenagers do not use Twitter. Most have signed up to the service, but then just leave it. The report alarmed many media analysts, but to young folk, it was quite unremarkable. The young use media quite differently and all at once. It is quite common for kids to have not one, but two cell phones in order to make use of different calling plans. Multitasking is the norm. Kids might have the tally on, but also their laptops open, instant messenger going, texts coming in, Skype on, Facebook open, a magazine nearby, the telephone at their ear, their other cell phone texting, YouTube on the laptop, email coming in, surfing a website, music playing, and on, and on, and on. The new digital natives are consuming more media, consuming it all at once, consuming it when they want and how they want, and the only common thing is that old people will never understand. Thanks, Dad. Joining me now are some actual young people. Eva Maria, author of You Shut Up, A Guide to Parenting Teenagers. Zachary Dorner, leader of the Young Greens. And Tai Ahu, who's studying law, history and Māori language at Victoria University. Welcome to you all. Um, perhaps we should start by uh, seeing how much of that rang a chord. Uh, who's on Twitter? Um, Me? <laughs> young Greens are, but I'm not personally. Facebook? Yep. yep. Facebook. MySpace? Or is no, that I deleted that ages ago. Yeah. Why? Um, because, I don't know, I, I wasn't using it as much. There are so many other social services that I was using. That, I don't know, MySpace just seemed like, it's all right. I've got my real friends, you know. I don't have to have them on a MySpace page. So uh, what, what role does, does social media play for you? Uh, because I've seen research that says young people get their news from social media. Do you, do you use it that way or is it for something else? Do I get news from social media? Not really, unless you want to know who's going out with who, I guess. That's, right. <laughs> That's the only news you'd be getting from um, kind of social so sort of stuff. Um, in terms of newspapers, like I personally won't, don't read newspapers because I search it up on the internet and... Um, I have, you know, you always have to keep up to date with what's happening on the internet is the perfect place to get that information from. Do you have two mobile phones? Yeah, oh, I have four. Really? <laughs> Why do you have four mobile phones, Eva? Okay, I'll tell you. There's one telecom one, so I can do 2,000 texts, which I do use up every single month, because you can only text your telecom friends. I've got one which is a Vodafone with a SIM card, because so that when I go overseas I can use the SIM card for that. Um, I don't really use it that much in New Zealand. Then I've got another Vodafone, which weirdly doesn't have a SIM card, and that's the one that I can get 60 minutes of free calling on. And I can text my Vodafone friends, and they can text me, because a lot of people are quite cheap, so they will only text no to one number. And then I've got another one, which is my backup. Which Just one? in case. <laughs> which one's your favourite? Um, my, oh, my telecom one was, because that's the one that I'm constantly on, but Vodafone is um, probably quite high up there, because I can video call now. Hmm. Woohoo! Are you going to go to Two Degrees? 
I'm thinking about it actually, so that'll put my fourth phone to use. There you go, I think yeah. they owe us now. Mm -hmm. um, what about you guys, more than one phone each? Actually, I, I only actually have one phone. I've got a uh, Vodafone uh, phone and, and I'm, I'm on a plan, so you know, I know a lot of young people don't really go on plans, but it, it suits my purpose as well. Mm. Zach? Um, just one, but uh, I used to have a Vodafone and a telecom, but I only need 500 texts, so I can do... Now, when our researcher asked you to tell us something about you, you gave us the link to your Facebook page. So it obviously plays a role for you. Well, how do you use it? Um, well, at the last election I was a candidate, so I had a politician's Facebook page. Um, and then I was also travelling last year, so it was quite handy for my personal page just to say, oh, you're on Facebook, because everyone in the world apparently is. So I just, you know, I have all the people I met while I was travelling on Facebook. So. Is it a source of information? Um, I have, you know, I have quite a lot of politically minded friends on Facebook, so occasionally there'll be a story or something that they'll link to, um, but mainly I think it's used for, there'll be causes or, you know, support this cause and you can join the group and that's kind of the main way people sort of express themselves um, on Facebook. And Ty? Uh, Facebook for me is, is just simply the most effective uh, fast way of communicating with people that usually I can't keep in touch with. Um, so I can simply leave a comment on someone's overseas, or, uh, the page of some one of my friends who's overseas. Um, I can message people who I can't talk to or, or who it's, it's just too expensive to text. So for the most part I use Facebook simply to catch up with people that I, I just can't do day to day. So what I'm hearing from all of you is that it's, it's a communications application, not necessarily a news or information one. I don't think so. Where do, where do you get your news from, Ty? Well, I, I, personally, I, I, I tend to spend a lot of time on stuff, um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but the, the, the main reason is because I have access to newspapers from all around the country, simply at the click of a button, and, and you know, I'm not going to go out and spend you know, $1.20 or $1.50 trying to buy every single newspaper to see the different interpretations of issues that are affecting us today, but I can do that on the internet much easier, much cheaper and much faster. Do you see something you relate to on it? Do you see yourself reflected in it? Um, look, look I, I, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't thought about it in that kind of depth, but I, I, it's part of my job, it's, it's part of what I do, it's part of youth culture today, and, and the internet is, is a convenient way to do it, and it's part of everyone's culture. It's not just youth that go on there. Um, there's obviously, obviously a market for it, and, and, and you know, I'd, I'd be silly not to take advantage of it. Hmm. Zach? Um, you must be a newspaper reader. You're a, you're a budding politician. Um, well, I just read the newspaper at um, university because they're free. Um, <laughs> but if I have to pay for it, I won't because, you know, it's all online and, you know, I, I'm an avid listener of national radio. So I get a lot of news from that. Well, actually, I thought the radio one was interesting and I thought that's yeah. something that maybe isn't borne out here that, no. you know, from the Morgan Stanley research. I mean, are you all radio listeners? Um, well, I, you know, listen to national radio, but I can't stand ads, so commercial radio is out. But I think lots of people listen to it in the car or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Eva, you went so far as to uh, write a book. Um, was there something amiss with the existing parenting advice that made you do it? Um, it's not really a miss. I think that there was a perspective missing, and the perspective was from the other side, not from the parent side, and that's um, that's the only reason. I mean, I've had my own experiences with parents and issues and um, relationships between adults and teenagers, which isn't always parents and teenagers. It can also be teachers and teenagers and employers and teenagers, and. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I scoped out, I researched for ages the different parenting books that were out there, but there wasn't any, in New Zealand especially, that was written from the other, the other point of view, the other side, the teenager side. Does that apply across the media in general? Do you, do you relate to the stories you see about young people? Um, no, not at all. I'm not a boy racer and I don't do drugs every single night. Um, and I'm not going to be part of that fight on Courtney Place. That happened, you know, last night, and it's. I think it's quite ridiculous. I mean, um, I think, yeah, it can. It shows that what what some teenagers are up to, but not all of them. Have you have you ever been text bullied? Because apparently all girls do that. No. 
No, people spam spam people just to be funny. But um, I I don't know. I think it was really interesting. I was on a panel last night, and um, a lot of adults were saying, "Well, text bullying is such a big problem," and I can respect the fact that it can be a problem. But it's just that none of the youth were saying it was a problem because uh, all the youth were trying to find alternatives to text bullying and how to make it better. Like you know, you can block the number, you can change cell phones, you can. Um, what else can you do? You can just delete the messages or, you know, ignore them or whatever. And all the adults were trying to say, well, it's such a big problem, it's such a big problem. So it was interesting. I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually wonder what, yeah, well, <clears throat> there's a degree of cyber panic uh, around various new yeah. media, around Bebo and things like that, and especially with the bullying thing. But you guys don't seem to, I mean, you're, you're maybe getting out of the age group, but did you ever have a problem with it? Was there anything that you couldn't just delete? No, mm. no, it's not the case for, for me. Certainly it's just... One might even say, it goes as far as to say it's fear-mongering, Pe people that are simply f fearful of this new technology that is available to young mm. people. Um, it, to, as it happens, I think that a lot of older people don't know how to use it, to be, to be quite frank. Yeah, yeah. And um, they, just, you know, they just perpetuate the, the problem, make it bigger than, you know, than it actually is. Mm. Now, Ty, one, one thing that came up in a, in a fascinating piece of research, uh, the New Zealand um, version of the World Internet Project, was that Maori and Pacific Island people, particularly younger ones, felt that the internet and social media in particular had strengthened their sense of cultural identity and their use of language. Has that been your experience? Um, yeah, to some, to some extent it has. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a project currently trying to make a legal Māori dictionary. And so as, as part of that project, we're, we're making a massive amounts of information um, from the House uh, of Representatives back in 1840s, certain Māori speeches that, that previously wasn't available. So it's important to recognise that the internet isn't just some tool that people can spam or, or people can scare other people, but actually it's a tool where people can access information and very it's a tool, easily. The tool that you all seem to yeah. feel in control of. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are any of you familiar with the Mazengarb report? Um, it has some terrible things to say about yeah, young people. I Wikipedia at that a few days ago because <laughs> I saw it on your blog. Well, I mean, I, it basically yeah. blamed the media for the, for the moral turpitude of young people, except it was in 1954. Uh, and um, the people who were in the gun then are now uh, on the pension and worried about you guys, well, oddly enough. Teenagers yeah. haven't changed, like, at all. Like, yeah. teenagers were always a problem throughout the ages, uh, and today teenagers are still a problem. Yeah, I, think I, I heard something about um, maybe in the Herald or something in the early 1900s where they were, um, you know, upset about... Um, Groups of youths riding horse carts too fast and showing their ankles and that kind of thing. So, you know, it's oh, no. probably it's the, just the, a the 1960 thing. Ha Hastings Blossom Festival riot. Look that one up. <laughs> Again, I want to come back to this thing of, of whether you relate to what you read in the media and, and whether it actually speaks to you. I mean, you're not big newspaper readers. What would you like to see more of? What stories do you think aren't being reported well enough for you? I think. Um, it sort of comes back to what Eva's book is about, um, which I think is great, um, in that, you know, the media is basically older people kind of, you know, young people did that and young people did this, and I don't feel like ever, there's never a story that has it from the youth point of view. The headlines are always, you know, young people drinking and boy races doing this, where it's, there's never, or, and there's, you know, just a little quote from someone or no, yeah. no young people. Or it's like a big blown up story about yeah. someone who, whose parents are financially capable to send them to like the most prestige school ever and how they've changed the world for one African kid or something. That's great. That's great. You know, like, but it, you know, it's, is it only the prestige people that can make a difference that are making a difference right now? There's a great number of people in the middle. Zach, um, you'd know as, uh, as, a, as a, a budding Green Party, well, as a Green Party candidate, that the Greens have been very good at attracting youth support, not so good at getting that vote to turn out. Yeah. What does that say to you? Because old people vote. Whatever you don't like about old people, they do actually get out and vote. Um, well, it says to me that not that there's a problem with young people, but there's a problem with our democracy and that it's not engaging young people. Um, you know, um, personally, I think we need more civics education and that kind of thing and more ways of making people feel like, you know, we're part of this democracy and we do have a voice rather than just, you know. Um, like, I think some of the problems are that um, it's sort of 
young people come up with or come come at things with a very open mind. We're not sort of well. I, my parents voted Labour all their life, so therefore I'm going to vote Labour. You know, they come at it with an open mind, but there's not sort of any good information that explains the political process and all the different parties and what their values are. And well, I have to say, if you campaigned on civics classes in schools, I might even vote for you. <laughs> um, well. That is all we have time for. Uh, thanks to Eva Maria, Zach Dorner and Tai Ahu. After the break, the inside view from young people in the media.